Well, good morning. good morning. So glad you're here. Uh, so glad for the cool weather. Amen. Who got the rain, by the way? I dropped. All right, because uh, I did not get any rain, and I've heard complaints about no rain. It, the, it tells me in the Bible that the rain falls on the just or unjust. But just not me, apparently. <laughs> so uh, here we are. Another Lord's Day to gather together and worship Him. To try to focus our minds on Him and Him alone. I know that we have the troubles of the world weighing on our hearts sometimes. Sometimes our minds can wander. Let us, this morning, as we worship, open our hearts to Him. Pray with me. Father, help us to focus on You. Help us to be still in our souls that we may hear your voice, that we may experience your presence. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
tells us, Thou shalt not kill. This commandment does not prohibit the killing of animals. That's, there's a very specific word here. It does not prohibit capital punishment. It does not prohibit war. It does not prohibit self-defense. But there are some roots to this commandment that are very important. Why? Why should not we not commit murder? Well, because it's against the law, right? But why is it against the law? In Genesis, it tells us that God created man in his own image. We are created with God's very image stamp on us. Being created in the image of God means that we are deserving of special treatment from each other. We're worthy of respect. We're worthy of dignity. In fact, a little bit later on in Genesis, this is before the law, before the Ten Commandments. God calls for the death penalty for the murder of another person. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. This is serious. And in Exodus, anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. So, see, we, we, it, there's a lot of types of killing that's not covered here because it's better translated, thou shalt not murder. A very specific word, murder. Murder means intentional killing. Premeditated, deliberate. It points to specific acts of violence. The NIV says, you shall not murder. Premeditated murder is universally viewed as a major crime, and the Bible records the first murder. Cain lured his brother Abel into a trap, and he murdered him. There's another type of murder we call manslaughter in the law. That's killing another person the spur of the moment. Murder is a strange thing. We have a thing called a hate crime on the statutes today. We voted in Congress or whoever and decided that some murders were worse than others. I never understood that, a hate crime. I, but I did understand there was such a thing as a crime of passion. You've heard that, right? If you watch any TV at all, they say it was a crime of passion. And so in this crime of passion, we, uh, we see that a person was jealous of some sort somehow. And often, if you watch Law and Order, where you can see all the murders you, you, you can handle, they talk, if they see a body that was particularly beat up, mutilated, you know, just beaten to death, we call that a crime of passion and rage. That was a murder that, that the person was filled with hatred and wanted to punish the person they murdered. But if you watch Criminal Minds, you see that the same thing could mean that the person's just a psychopath. They had no rage, no passion. They were just doing it because they're serial killers. Clearly, there are all kinds of nuances in this idea of murder. And somehow we have this thing now called murder with special circumstances. Those are hate crimes and whatever. But you know that you can be guilty of murder if you're driving the getaway car of a bank robbery and you're just sitting in the car and the person who actually went in with a gun killed somebody, you and the, you the driver are guilty of murder. That's the law of the land, not the law of the Lord. Because the Lord very simply says, you shall not murder, period. Doesn't talk about hate crimes, doesn't talk about crimes of passion, robberies, accessories, abetting, an accessory after the fact. You heard of uh, Dr. Mudd, maybe? As in your name is Mudd? He was a physician who helped set the leg of John Wilkes Booth, the murderer of, uh, of, of Lincoln, unless I got the name wrong, he murdered somebody. And all he did was set the, the, the leg, and uh, he was guilty of an accessory after the fact of the assassination of the president. And we still don't know to this day whether he actually knew what he was doing, what he knew where, where Booth was coming from. His, uh, apparently he had his cell phone off, and he didn't get the tweet. <laughs> 
there's indirect killing that could be murder. Like, for instance, David sent Uriah the Hittite into his, to his death, lead and put him in the lead in the worst of the fighting, and he was killed. And the Bible tells us that David was guilty of his murder. Now, understand that a lot of other people died. Somebody had to lead that fight, right? Somebody had to be there at the front. But Uriah was specifically put there, and it was the intent of David that Uriah died. And the intent of David that Uriah died was to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. He would take Bathsheba as his wife or his concubine or something, and it would all be covered up and it would all be good. But God was watching. And God said, you shall not murder. Sometimes murder is an act of negligence. You know, the Bible says if a bull gores a man or woman to death, the owner shall not be held responsible because it's an accident. Ironically, today we would call it an act of God. But God didn't call it that. It was just one of those things. However, if you have a bull that's been known to kill, and you have it running around loose, and that bull kills somebody, then that person is guilty of murder. In fact, in the first case, the bull will be put to death for killing a human. In the second place, both the bull and the owner will be put to death because a human death was taken negligently. Also, there's a, it talks about when you build a house, you need to build in such a way where someone is not going to be killed by your negligent building. You know, there was a, an apartment building in Miami somewhere that collapsed with people in it. An apartment building collapsing. Just picture that for a moment. You're in an apartment building. It's solid. You know, it's a house. Would you have walked up, you know, to the third floor or something like that, thinking it might collapse? No, you expect it to stand still. Why? Well, for, for sure, right now, we have zoning laws. And you have to build it to, or I mean codes, building codes. You have to build it according to code. It's got to be able to withhold the weight of itself, if nothing else. And so these people are killed. Oddly enough, in the Bible, the builders would be held accountable and they would be called murderers. Today's law, you might be guilty of murder if you were in that getaway car, but you're not guilty of murder for building shoddy things that would kill people. And so think about that. You know, one of the stories that, that if you're ever being trained, uh, taking FDA training, Food and Drug Administration, in the initial training they tell you this story about a group of men who built, who were selling cough medicine, and apparently cough medicine must be terrible tasting, because nobody here has ever taken cough medicine that wasn't in syrup. And so they used antifreeze. If I was smarter, I would tell you what the chemical was, because they didn't call it antifreeze. There was this very sweet chemical that they used, and, well, you guys know antifreeze is poison, and it killed children, and they went to prison for that. There's so many ways that we can be negligent and cause deaths. Well, maybe not we, but if we were powerful, well, you know what, maybe we, because sometimes we have the power to build something. We, have, we might be a mechanic working on somebody's brakes and doing a bad job. You know, someone I know one time uh, had gotten a brake job, and on the highway, the brakes failed. Absolutely failed. And the only reason this person was alive because they had presence of mind to pull the emergency brake up. That's in the days when we drove stick shifts and the emergency brake was right there. And brought the car up. But that, you know, that could have been a negligent homicide. There's so many ways that we can do if we're not mindful of what we're doing. It could be something that small. It could be something great. Think of jet engine mechanics and inspectors, drug manufacturers, so many ways. Before child labor laws existed, young children were put to work in factories on machines with unsafe conditions, and children were killed by these unsafe machines. The command 
cover, this, this commandment covers such things as knowingly allowing an unsafe act or condition. You know, we, we make our own laws now, sometimes irrespective of what God would have us to do. And so we have medically sanctioned some types of murder. We, some, well, there, I shouldn't say we because not every case this is true in every country, but in some countries, we kill people when they become useless. In ancient times, we would sacrifice the elderly when we were hunter-gatherer tribes in order to save the whole family. You might be stalked by an animal, and we know that from watching animals stalking cattle and horses and whatever out there, they always look for the weak, the one that's being left behind, and they attack that, and all they want to do is eat. So they would leave the elderly behind, the ones that were no longer used to, the ones that couldn't keep up. And they would offer that up as a sacrifice. Sometimes infants would be offered up as sacrifice because they were slowing down. And so God was trying to create a people that would respect life, whether they're elderly or whether they're infants. The Nazis began to eliminate people that were a problem for them. And a lot of people agree. People that were uh, developmentally disabled, people that were somehow sick, they would euthanize them. And there wasn't a lot of objection. And then it became somewhat political. You see, uh, Hitler and some of his top people believed that uh, humans, Aryans, were descended from a master race, and that there were animalistic races on the earth that were breeding with humans somehow, and weakening the race, and among these were the Jews. And so he wanted to eliminate all the Jews, to exterminate them. And he was able to get rid of six million of them. But not only Jews, gypsies were also uh, on that list. The gypsies are a people known as Roma, who no longer had a homeland. They wandered through Europe for some reason or another. And Hitler wanted to eliminate them, of course, gay people. And there was a long list of people that Hitler and the Nazis believed to be subhuman, and the best thing to do is exterminate them because they were inconvenient, maybe even dangerous. Abortion is another way to destroy life. It's another form of euthanasia. God regarded you as a person while you were in the womb. In Psalms it says for you, were, you created my inmost being, knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You know, it goes a little bit further than that. God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appoint you as a prophet to the nations. We begin by dehumanizing and then it makes it easier to kill. As a soldier, I had to deal a lot with the idea of killing. I praise God that I never had to take a life. But I did learn that taking a life was very difficult. Humans do not naturally kill. They had studies where they showed uh, in World War II that most soldiers did not actually kill anybody, that uh, most deaths were caused indirectly by bombs and stuff like that, artillery. They, uh, they said that the best way to make sure that humans were actually shooting humans was through crew-served weapons because somebody's watching you. 
But if nobody's watching you, you're not going to do it. That was very strange. World War II is when we first discovered that. But studying weapons at Gettysburg and other places like that, they would pick up these rifles and they would find that the rifles were never fired. That they, that they, they, know, they know that because they have multiple balls stuffed in them. You see, in a combat situation like the, Civil, like the Civil War, you know, you fire a weapon, you have to reload it. You can't tell if fired a weapon and all that smoke and all that noise, but you can see me reloading. So if you see me reloading, you assume that I fired, but it was very hard. Now, one of the tools that we use to get soldiers to kill other soldiers is to dehumanize them, to call them something, goof something. You make up a name for them that's less than human. Now, I, I know Americans did that, but so did the Japanese. Americans call Japanese soldiers monkeys, and Japanese soldiers call American soldiers gorillas, apes. Interesting that we would use similar words against each other, but the idea is that you would dehumanize them. The problem with dehumanizing like that is that we have all these horrible war crimes because you begin to think of the other of a person as not a person, and then you can do whatever you want to them to spend your rage. So today we're a lot more modern. We're not allowed to call the enemy names. Can you believe that? Mm. <laughs> it's politically incorrect for a soldier to call the enemy a name. How evolved we are. <laughs> However, what we're trained to do now is to shoot to movement. So you're not thinking of shooting a person. You're trained specifically that when something moves, this is why soldiers train with pop-up targets. So that when something moves, I shoot. Because it's a big difference between my shooting a paper target and shooting something that looks like a human. So the key here is we're dehumanizing people. And it makes it easier for us to commit murder because we set parameters and this is okay. Jesus said, you have heard it said this to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who commits murder is subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, that whoever says, you fools, in danger of hellfire. Jesus moves right to the heart of the matter. It's not the act of killing, it's the hatred in your heart that leads to killing. And maybe the indifference Maybe just the indifference that you don't care. You know, that, that's the deal with capital punishment today. It's very far from us. We don't know, we don't care, we barely hear it in the news. But if any one of us today had to so much as push a button to take someone's life, I'm not sure any of us here can do it. I certainly couldn't. But we separate from that, and then we think it's okay. Can you imagine driving down the road on your way to work, and you wind up shooting somebody in another car? Can you imagine that? How does that happen? I believe it begins with hatred in the heart, doesn't it? Somehow or another, this person in the other car has challenged your honor to the point that they need to die. How does that happen? You hear about it all the time, but well, not all the time, thankfully. But often enough that somebody's chasing somebody in a car for whatever reason, chasing them all the way, <coughs> all the way home. And then dumpling. You know, I know that guns don't kill people. People kill people. Hate kills people. Indifference kills people. How can a Christian take a life if we're called to lead people into eternal life, into abundant life? How would we be able to develop the rage and the hatred? I really don't know. It's hard. There was a time in my life 
where I tried to avoid triggers that would stir up whatever it was in me that was trained to, to hurt other people. And by the way, a lot of that was inside my heart before the Marines and the Army got a hold of me, so I'm not going to blame anybody outside, but there were certain triggers and I tried to avoid them, and then I realized I can't avoid them. I have to face them, and I have to be able to face them and not allow it to take over me. You know, one of the greatest tools against murder is silence. Can you believe that? 90% of the problems in the world would end if you just shut up. <laughs> I, f I learned that the hard way as a teenager, knowing that uh, one more word is what got me in a fight. <laughs> if I had not said anything, it would be over. And luckily I learned to do that. There's so many things that are best left unsaid. And you can put your heart in another place. Like for instance, I choose to believe that that other person in that car is telling me that I'm number one in their heart. <laughs> That's what that means. <laughs> one of the ways I learned to practice peace, and by the way, we have to practice peace, we have to wage it, was I had an hour long commute each way, every day. And you know, the longer you're on the highway, the greater chances there are that you're gonna meet somebody that's going to exhibit road rage or make you exhibit road rage. And so I had to consciously ask God to remind me of what my job was. My job was to get to work and then to get home, period, in the conversation. How long was it gonna take? It doesn't matter. You see, because this car that whipped around me, whipped right in front of me, because it's only one lane, he's going to get there 10 seconds, two minutes faster than me. How much longer is it going to take if I hit them? Have you ever had that feeling you just want to bump them one time? Wouldn't that add to your commute? There's a story I heard about a 70-year-old policeman. You might have heard it, 70-something. He's at a theater, and the guy in front of him is using his cell phone. That's against the law, against the rules of the theater, I should say. And he's offended. He is offended. And so he says something. And the guy, big guy, I know that that, uh, that that's adds to the situation. This guy is big and used to, I'm sure, used to not getting confronted. But the guys confront the 70 year old guy is a retired cop. So he's used to standing his ground. He can't be intimidated. My niece is a Miami Dade police officer, and she's about this tall. So I know from her how you don't you're not intimidated by somebody else's size. And so the 70 year old shot. Well, this guy threw something at him. I think it was popcorn. And the guy shot, the 70-year-old shot. And everybody was upset, and I'm thinking, well, what's the 70-year-old? You know, they say he was unarmed. He's not unarmed. He's a huge guy. And he should have been armed if he was going to attack somebody else, I think. But the bottom line is a 70-year-old man shot somebody, killed him. Because he was offended about somebody using a cell phone and breaking a rule. And the person using his cell phone was offended that he would be confronted because whatever folks we can't get there we can't go there that's where silence helps minding your own business i know this sounds weird to you because i'm a pastor and you know me but i often think that any confrontation that i get into is going to end in death mine or the other person's and so because of that i just stay out of it now, don't get me wrong, if somebody's being hurt, attacked, you know, if a crime is being committed and someone is in danger, I might act. I probably will act. But I don't have to act over somebody using a cell phone in a theater. And it begins with, I think, forgiveness. Forgiving somebody in advance for something they did. You don't know what's going on through this person's mind. For one thing, you don't know if they might be carrying a gun. 
That's an important thing to consider. So, when is it to you? And so I think maybe we need a reset in our hearts and in our lives. A reset that we're going to deal with forgiveness and love instead of offense and anger. If we're going to decide in advance that the other person is probably having a hard time in whatever's going on or doesn't know any better, and then maybe we pray for something better to happen. Or pray that we become stronger and better out of this encounter. The Great Gatsby is, uh, it's got to be my favorite novel. I just, I, I love the way those words are put together. I love that Scott Fitzgerald. And at the beginning of it, Nick, the narrator, tells us that his father told him one time that before we judge another man, we need to understand that maybe he didn't have all of her advantages. Now the point of that, if you know the story, Nick is uh, not rich, you know, just a working class kind of guy, and uh, he, his cousin, Daisy Buchanan, is filthy rich. I mean, rich as rich can be. And so he believes that just because she's rich, that she hasn't had all the advantages he has had. So think about that when you encounter the person. Maybe they didn't have all the advantages you had and deal with love. Jesus clearly is telling us that our angry thoughts, although the government will not prosecute us for angry thoughts, not yet, hmm. but they're going to lead to something that's prosecutable. He said, from, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, and murders. Cain killed his Abel because of his jealousy. And so the words raka and fool, raka means empty-headed, idiot, something like that. Just something that you say to people carelessly, but clearly something you can say in public. Although today you can say anything in public, apparently. You are dehumanizing the person. You're making them less than you. Ephesians tells us, be angry and do not sin. So it is possible to have these emotions erupt from you and you shut them down. So we must rid yourself, and a caution says, rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Without a doubt, anger, hate, and, well, even more important, dehumanizing people. Think of yourself better than. Hurts us spiritually. God told us that if we cannot forgive, we cannot receive forgiveness. Now, it's easy to think of that as a tit for tat. You know, if I forgive, I can be forgiven. But it's deeper than that, more complicated. It has to do with the matter of your heart. If you carry forgiveness in your heart, if you carry love, if you carry a servant attitude in your heart, then you're on your way. You know, there's a, a thing Marines do that uh, is automatic. Seniors, you eat, the juniors eat before the seniors. So as an NCO, if I'm standing in the chow line and a private comes up, I let them get in front of me. And I keep backing up until all the junior guys have eaten, then I can eat. It's a, a strange bit of humility for a service that is just so full of arrogance and machismo, isn't it? But you let the juniors eat first. So I'm thinking if I can do that in a setting like that, what do I care that a car wants to get in front of me? In fact, there's a little bit, of a, there's a saying I tell myself whenever somebody does that, so that I'd rather have it in front of me than behind me because they're tailgating the car in front of me. One time, 
there was these people trying to get in traffic coming in on the on-ramp, and one of them, for some reason, was tailgating the car in front of him, but he, at the last minute, he figured out he couldn't occupy the same space I did, so they got behind me. And then he started tailgating me. By the way, I'm in the right-hand lane. So as I'm driving along, the truck in front of me suddenly moves to the side, and there's a ladder on the road. I have to move quickly, but I can get around the ladder. The guy behind me was tailgating me, so he didn't see the ladder until he was on top of it. Got slammed on his brakes, lost control of his car, and he wasn't hurt, but he wound up way on the grass. You know, if that, had that been uh, one of those areas where you could drop off, it would have been ugly. It's good to be careful. It's bad to be rageful. <laughs> what if I decide that was a competition or something? I don't know. But I practice peace as much as I can. And I've got to tell you, I've been getting better at it over the years. There are fewer things that I get angry at. And I know that anger in my heart immediately is a trigger to let me know that I still have sin in my heart. And I need to seek forgiveness and peace from God. But folks, I've got to tell you, aside from road rage, the greatest thing you can practice, the greatest practice of peace is silence. Not saying things that do not have to be said. Giving the other person a benefit of the doubt when you're offended. Maybe they didn't mean it that way. There's a communication card in your bulletin. I'd like to take you... You don't take the opportunity now as we listen to this song to worshipfully consider, worshipfully consider what God is laying on your heart right now. Is there anger you need to let go of? Is there forgiveness? Is there some sort of thing you need to forgive a forgiveness from? An incident which you allowed to let get out of control. However God is leading you, go ahead and write it down. Put it in the offering plate this week. Sing the song. <clears throat>
Charlotte and Steve to come forward. I'm going to give you this opportunity now to come and pray. If God has laid a burden on your heart, if you want to know more about the abundant life that God has called us to, come as we sing this song. Thank you. 